Praise God. Praise God. Now, the home within this context is not limited to your biological family because some people do not have a home with their biological family. We don't live in a perfect world. Especially in Africa, some people grew up with their uncles, their aunts. And, you know, some people um, do not even grow up in healthy environments. So it's, it's not just fixed. It could be a church. Yes, I had some experiences in my own home, my biological home with my families, family members that prepared me. But I also had very tangible experiences when I gained admission into school that prepared me the more for ministry. Praise God. So do you understand what I'm saying? Are you, do you understand what I'm saying? Not really. Thank you for your sincerity. Now, home within this context is not limited to your biological family because home can be transitional in some seasons in our lives. Home is a place where you live or work or fellowship where you're cared for, held responsible and accountable. So I, I, I want us to broaden our mind when I say the home. I'm not talking about just where you're raised with your parents, with your father and your mother. Um, I'm talking about the places where God will plant you per time, per season. There are people who leave their biological parents, who leave their families, and then they get to school or to their place of work, and that's where they are trained for life, not even for ministry. I remember um, one of my roommates was when she gained admission, she learned to cook. She never cooked at home. She was that time she learned to cook. It was that time she learned how to lay her bed. I'm not joking. We taught her how to lay her bed. We taught her several things. So, the home, yes, you, you will learn some things from your biological family, but sometimes the lessons you will learn that will prepare you for the future that God has for you may happen outside the four walls of your home. Praise God. Now, what are the lessons we must learn at home so we're effective in ministry? I'll read a quote by Pastor Funke Adejumo. You know, she's always preaching this. It says, home is where it first works before you set out. If it has not worked for you, don't sell it. If it has not worked for you, don't sell it. Now, I'll tell us a sh very short story. You know how I began, Nova Woman started as a result of something I lacked as a child growing up. At the age of nine, my parents were separated. My mom left, and at that time, I didn't really know what was happening. Growing up, I started aching for that maternal love. And it was, you know, now when I see blended families, stepmoms and teenagers, now I can look back and appreciate what they're going through better and not judge anyone. And, you know, it was taking me time. It was taking myself and my stepmom time for us to bond because I was the oldest. I was a bit aware. I mean, I was nine going to ten, so I'm aware somebody else is trying to take my mom's place. So there was a bit of a... Uh, um, friction, so to say. And at that time, I was aching for maternal love, so I began to give myself that maternal love. So I would say things like, when I'm sweeping, ah, told me, Pele. <laughs> so when you finish sweeping, you go and eat your food. Ah, I would have conversations with myself, told me, your period, stomach is, are you sure you should not have one bath? You know, because I wanted that love, and it was not there. So I began to give that love to myself, and I also saw how some of my siblings reacted to that vacuum. So I learned to love myself, love the women around me, just a bit. By the time I gained admission, I was in an environment hungry for the kind of love that God had given to me. Because even before I gave my life to Christ, I was, I was already talking to God. By that time, I didn't know it was, it was really a relationship with God. Because every time I'm hurt, I will go to God and I'll stand by my window Till now, I still like to look up to the sky sometimes and feel like I'm having a direct conversation with God. And I'll stand and say, oh, see what this person did to me. And I still do it till now. Even when my husband does something, I say, can you see your son? He said this, he said that, he did this. Hmm. If I react, I say, no, no, don't react. I know you can react, but don't react. <laughs> so, you know, I will take out time to talk to God about my feelings. And God, God will speak to me. He wasn't speaking to me in scriptures. But some of the things he would tell me is like, are things like... Um, you are beautiful. You're more beautiful than that. You can't stoop low like that. You're not a beast. I, he said that to me a lot. You're not a beast. You're a beautiful woman on the inside. 
So I got to school, and then shortly after that, I gave my life to Christ, and I began to fellowship with God the more, and I realized that much life was living for God. Initially, I thought that much life was purpose. No, it was living for God, having that relationship with God. And I took that seed and began to share with people on campus. And that's how I grew my influence over young ladies. Praise the Lord. Now, that, that experience, what happened to my parents, created a vacuum in me that gave me capacity to reach out to women. So initially, it was just about loving women. It wasn't about teaching scriptures. I only taught scriptures because I knew that was the answer to some of the things that they were going through. Like when they come, when they say this person has two boyfriends, I'm like, okay, God does not like this thing. Because that's the final authority. If I say I don't like it, you will not listen. God does not like this thing. But eventually, God gave me a mandate and said, okay, begin to disciple women for me. So I'm saying that some of the experiences that you're going through now is the preparation by the Lord. Imagine if Joseph had checked out of the processes of God over his life. Imagine when he got to the house of Potiphar, Madame now said, Joseph, sleep with me. I mean, let's be sincere. Just think for a minute that you are Joseph. You have been sold to Iraq. They took you to Iraq, not America. You know some of us, if they kidnap us and take us to America, we will stay there. They took you to Iraq. And this man now comes to you and says, sleep with me. I'll sort you out. You will do quick math. Sleep, I'll date her for six months. Save up some money. Get my visa, she won't know. One day she will send me on official business. I'll take her car, pack it at the airport, and I'm off. If you get back home and you tell your father, your father is a pastor, and you tell your dad, daddy, ah, I had to sleep with um, Oga's wife to get here. Even your father will say, God will forgive you, God will forgive you. It's even God that put the love in, your, in her heart. Ah, is it normal for a, well, a wealthy woman to be looking at a slave? Is it that there are no big, big men in the community? For her to have looked at a young slave is the love of God. But you know what? Joseph submitted to that process. It did not make sense. What you are going through now may not make sense. What you are going through at your place of work, in your church now, may not make sense. It did not make sense. But Joseph just trusted God. And eventually... He led to his promotion. Praise God. Praise the living Jesus. So, what are the lessons that we can learn from home? For single ladies, I'll start with single ladies. You know, many single ladies despise their parents and guardians. We just want to leave home. Very few, if you talk, can you relate to what I'm saying? If you talk to single ladies, men people don't want to stay at home. Men, some go to school, they don't come back. They go to live with their friends, you know. They just want to leave home. Their parents don't understand them. They're still treating them. You know, I was surprised when she said she had to plead with her parents to come here today. That's rare. And that's a graduate. It's not like she's in secondary school. That's rare. I studied law not because I love law. My passion is mass communication. I wrote JAM 2002. University of Radekiti did not have mass communication then, so their mass comm and theatre art was called English art. And then 2003, I'm not getting the dates, I think 2004, I wrote again, was that 2003 and 2004, 2002 and 2003? No, 2003, 2004, 2004, I wrote again, and this time around I chose law because someone in church mentioned to my dad, ah, the way this guy is always doing presentation should be good for a lawyer. So my dad said, ah, I'm a lawyer, them and lawyer, they respect them a lot. So, you know, go and study law. And that time too, you know, they Telling people that I feel law was very cool. Then I gained admission, I saw that this law thing, man, I don't like it. And so 200 level, I packed my things and went back home. And I told my dad, after waiting three years for admission, that I was not going back to school. I was going to write another jump. That I did not like the course I was studying. My father would not have it. My father is a typical African man. Like he's the lion of the tribe of our home. And... During that time, I was serious about it. And my dad threatened me and said all sorts. And I kept talking to God, you know, was back and forth like, God, what are you saying? This is what I want to do. You have a mandate for my life. I've seen my future. This man is trying to hinder me from the future that you're giving to me. And God said something to me. God said, I saw your father in his temperaments, in his wisdom. And this exposure that you're saying is not enough. I saw everything about him. And yet I trusted him with you. Can you trust my wisdom? 
right now you have parents who seem like they don't respect your anointing. They don't respect your depth. When you get home, they still scold you over those things and talk to you. You have mentors who, when you come around them, they don't treat you the way every other person treats you. They're always instructing you and teach you th- teaching you things. Can you trust the wisdom of God for bringing you under these people? That's what God told me. He said, I know the dreams I put in your heart. I know everything about you. And yet, I took you. I did not go and put you in a family where the man is already a senior advocate of Nigeria or is a judge. I put you under this man. And I said, this man should be your father. Can you trust my wisdom? And so God is saying, can you trust his wisdom? Why he has planted you in that family? Joseph was betrayed by his own brothers. And yet he had such huge dreams. Did it make sense that his brothers would betray him? I'm sure at that time, Joseph must have thought to himself, I'm never going to achieve these things. Is it really going to happen? Praise God. Praise the living Jesus. So number one thing you must learn that you can learn at home is to respect the sovereignty of God. What does it mean to respect the sovereignty of God? It means to follow the leading of God. To follow, it's not easy to follow the leading of God. And it's easy. It's easy for those who are fully surrendered to God. But if you're still at that place where you want to make things happen for yourself, you're going to struggle with the leading of God. To respect the sovereignty of God, to know that He knows your end, even before He created you. He has a future for you, so you can trust Him. If He says, This is the Lord, I am going here, and He says, Go this way, can you trust Him? Praise God. Praise the living Jesus. Respect the sovereignty of God. Number two is to trust God. Home is a place where we learn to trust God. Because at home, they can't see all this packaging, all this mama, all this. For the married women, you can mama people outside. When you get home, you are missus, you are his wife, he will call you by your first name, he will scold you. So you learn to trust God. I've had calendars, I've had times when I fix programs and my husband would say, this cannot work now. I'm like, but God would have us do it now. I said, it can't work now. We can't afford it now. We can't do this now. And I'll have to cancel the programs, the program. Because these things will test your heart. It would really, really test if it's about you or it's about God. If it's about God, then you can trust God to make it happen. You can trust God to make it work out well. If you have a bad reputation at home, what exactly are you taking out? If you cannot trust God, you cannot put on a good character at home and then put on a good character outside. Your ability to trust God will reflect very well. First, see, I'm here now, I can pretend to be all sorts, and you would never know. You know, sometimes we hear news about celebrities, things about their lives, and we are shocked that, oh, this person has always been like this, and we never know. People can show you what they want you to see. But the people at home are the people giving you the correct feedback. Pay attention to what they are saying. Pay attention to what they are saying. At home also, we learn service. Because ministry is about service, and it's not serving the way you want it. A minister is like a waiter. When you go to the restaurant, the waiter waits on you for you to make your order. The waiter cannot come to you and say, Madam, please, you are eating yam and egg. Madam, what you will take is rice and beans. Is it possible? No, it's not possible. The waiter is just going to stand by you and wait for you to make your order. You cannot determine the kind of people that will come to you. And so at home, we don't determine how we serve our, our family members. You cannot determine how you serve your parents. There are times you want to take a nap, and your parents will call you for the single days and say, I need you to run some errands for me. That time you're seeing a movie, a very nice movie. I mean, something is about to happen. See, these little things are preparing us for the future. If you have not submitted, how can you lead other people? If you fail at following, you cannot lead effectively. 
You have not followed a leader. Some of us are seated here. We have never submitted to any mission. You've never submitted. Everywhere you get to, you do your thing the way you want to do it. I mean, if it's not working out for you, you check out. You don't have much business with this. You do what works for you. How can you lead other people effectively? Do you know how to relate with people and tell them, do you know what it means to be a shepherd? You're going to talk to some people and they will follow. And some people will sit down. You have to go to them and explain to them and follow them up. It's one step at a time because you understand what it means to follow. You know that conviction happens for each person at different levels. We learn to serve. There are times you will serve. It's not because you're feeling the Holy Ghost, but because you know this has to be done. This has to be done. There are times you have to go and visit your members, not because it's convenient for you. There are times you will stay awake. You will sacrifice your sleep until that lady comes out of surgery. You keep calling to check. Is she out? How is it going? I remember early this year, one of my protégés called me, and then she said to me that there was an issue at a place of work, a place of work and then EFCC was involved, someone was being to implicate, and it was a serious issue. I mean, millions involved. Even if I don't have the millions, I can't even raise it for it. It was too much. It was some big wahala coming from nowhere to just rest on her. I was going to eat that day. I could not eat. Because I imagined it was my younger sister. If you have not learned to serve at home, if you have not learned to serve the people that you see every day, Scripture says that if you cannot love your brother that you can see, how can you say you love God? If you have not served the people that you can see every day, that are around in your church, in your home, at your place of work, you want to serve people that God is bringing from nowhere. It's a lie. It's a, it, see, when reality meets, when your dream meets reality, you'll see that you have not built the capacity to do what you desire to do. And that's how you find people who live lives that do not align with the values that they proclaim. This is their values. They say this is what I want to be a diligent person, but they have not trained themselves to be diligent. When the opportunities came for them to be diligent, they, did, they were looking for the spiritual, you know, we want to choose how God will prepare. You cannot choose how God will prepare you. You cannot choose your preparation process. So whatsoever your hands find to do right now, do it with all your might. What is God trying to do in you right now? In your, through your marriage, through your husband. He's always telling you, you are not obedient. You are not submissive. You are saying, ah, me that God has called. I can interpret the scripture. I can pray for three hours. I'm submissive. Pay attention to that man. He knows what he's saying. At least you did not go and pick him from arrow. So he knows what he's saying. Your parents are constantly telling you, you are proud. You are proud. You don't apologize when you are wrong. You are proud. That is feedback. Don't joke with it because it will come out later. It will come out. If they are telling you you are proud, then take it as some serious feedback. Go and tell them, say, Mommy, why are you always saying I'm proud, I'm proud? And then she can tell you, it's not because you don't kneel down to greet me. But whenever I correct you, it takes time for you to acknowledge that you are wrong. Even when you know that you are wrong. Take it and walk on it. Praise God. See, trust the wisdom of God for planting you in that place. Trust the wisdom of God for planting you in that place. Trust the wisdom of God. It is not a waste. Don't waste your upbringing. Don't waste your background. I know we like to hear your background should not put your back to the ground. Yes, it should not put your back to the ground, but learn from it. Because if you don't learn from it, it will put your back to the ground. If you come from a poor home, where your father did not, does not have financial intelligence, I mean, or maybe he had some lazy habits, and you don't learn from your dad how not to do things. You can say from now to tomorrow that my background will not put my back to the ground, but if you don't do things better, then the background will put your back to the ground. Praise God. Praise the living Jesus. I also want to mention, for those of us that are facing adverse circumstances at home, it was designed to make you, to make you better. It was designed to make you better. I learned how to deal with my anger at home. Where you are hurt and you cannot speak out all the terrible things going on in your head. I remember one day I was so hurt, I went into my bathroom and sat under the shower. And... I made a noise I did not understand. It was a unique noise. Because I knew the Holy Spirit was restraining me. It was not something, if I'd responded, yes, because, I mean, I was hurt. 
No one had the right to do that to me. But I restrained myself that day for the sake of God. It wasn't even about ministry. It wasn't, there was no ministry that time. God is preparing you now. Pay attention to the things that God is bringing your way. If you don't learn hospitality at home, you cannot do it in ministry. You can do it when you want to impress people. Maybe they invited Pastor Nathaniel Bassi, Mommy Funke Adejimo. But when it comes to people that God has put under you, and you have 10 women just show up in your house Friday evening, and say, so Tom, we're just passing by, we should say hello to you. You just got back from work, you are tired. If you have not been trained to care for people, you will just wave bye bye to them. Even water, you will not offer them. What kind of a leader will that make you? First Timothy chapter 3 talks about a bishop. If you will be a bishop, you must be given to hospitality. One who rules his own. Husband of one, of, one, um, of one wife. You must also be wife of one husband. Given to hospitality. There are people that you can never penetrate their hearts until you care for them. And we learn these things at home. We learn hospitality at home. Learn to care. Pay attention to how you serve. They are constantly telling you the way you serve. This is not how to serve food. I'm like, please, 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 nobody should disturb me. Hospitality is key. Praise God. Praise the living Jesus. Now, for the married ladies, very quickly, let me just mention this. I, and I think I've said it um, before. Your marriage is important. If you're going to arrange um, you, God, marriage, ministry, what should be the other? Four things now. You, God, marriage, ministry. Can someone please arrange it very quickly? Other priority. God, you, ministry. Uh -uh, we're wise women. Please. Your marriage is very important. Your husband is very important. You have become one. It may not be called to ministry. The fact that you are in ministry does not mean that you would marry someone who is in ministry. Praise God. Um, um, Pastor Bimbo Dukoya's daughter, Tolu Ijogun, is her husband in ministry. The fact that you are called to ministry does not mean your husband will be called to ministry. And it does not mean that you should despise the man or disrespect him. God does not joke with marriage. The marriage covenant is very powerful. If you honor your husband, you allow yourself maximum expression. God told me about two or three years ago, he said, if you succeed in your marriage, then you are prepared for ministry. He did not even say you have succeeded. He said, then you are prepared for ministry. Because nobody will annoy you more than your husband. It's not possible. Because the two of you are operating on the ministry of see finish. You have seen yourself finish. Nobody will annoy you more than your husband. Nobody will tell you the truth without packaging more than your husband. You can finish preaching and your, your husband will tell you, and get and tell you, you always take too much time. It's in discipline. And I'm like, ah, ah, program that I've been fasting for for one week. I now use 15 minutes extra. See the way you are talking to me. And you, know I've not, you can't even allow me to put food in my mouth. Nobody will annoy you more than your husband. The ability to honor and respect your man, it says a lot about you. It says a lot about you. So please, don't joke with your marriage. Don't put your ministry before your marriage. It's an error. Praise God. And pay attention to your children. My first ministry is my marriage. Pay attention to your children. If you're busy running around preaching the gospel all over the world and you fail to raise your children in the right path, very soon, years from now, there will be your testimony and may our children not bring disgrace and shame to our names in Jesus' name. There will be your testimony. They will be everywhere. And they will show the seeds that you have planted or failed to plant in them. That's what they will carry around. They will be the truth. They will be the testimony of your ministry, whether indeed you are a woman called by God or a woman running after some self-ambition.